This morning as we prepare for the word, let us go first before the throne. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise you and we glorify and we honor you, God. We just give your name praise and glory just for the opportunity, God, to break the bread of life with your people today. And Father, we know, God, without a doubt that we can do nothing, Lord, can't preach, can't pray, can't do anything without your grace, God, without your spirit, Lord. So I submit myself to you, Lord God, that you would use me in any way you choose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. I want to first give honor to the Currys, Apostle Warren and Pastor Tierra for all that they are doing, all that they are providing for the people of God, their labors of love, their encouragement, and their encouragement not only to the people of God, but just to reach out and to minister uh, with a heart of love to everyone that they uh, come in contact with. And that is God's plan for us. And so I just appreciate you all. I bless you and I honor you today uh, in the name of Jesus. I wanna honor my man of God, uh, Willie Davis, amen. Amen, praise God, praise God. This morning, I wanna share uh, with you from the book of Acts chapter 26. I want to talk a little bit today about commitment. I want to talk about commitment because commitment is often motivated by what we believe or what we have faith in. Commitment is the act of committing, pledging, or engaging oneself It probably would help if I had glasses on. Commitment is the act of pledging or engaging oneself. When we think about commitment, we think about what is involved before we commit. That could be for a relationship, employment, a career, or anything that we want to be involved in. Lately, when I am cooking, and I am a good cook, if I might say so myself, I tend to look at the ingredients. I look at the ingredients if the uh, recipe calls for about 16 different things. I make up in my mind that I don't want to commit to that recipe. I'm like, I don't want to commit to it. It's going to take two hours. I, that's not what I want to commit to today. And so I make no commitment to that. And sometimes I make no commitment to cooking. So I say, I'm just don't, I just don't want to do it. So, but we are involved in what we commit ourselves to. Um, we commit ourselves to relationships, our children. Uh, we commit ourselves to the actions that we uh, show. And sometimes based on the commitment that we believe is necessary, things fall apart. If you have a relationship that you're not really committed to, that you don't give or you're not involved in it like you really need to be, then that relationship may fall apart. If you don't invest in your children like you should or need to, uh, you don't make that commitment for their lives, those children's lives, their development may fall apart. I wanna add on to that belief. Belief is a subjective attitude that a proposition is true, an opinion or a conviction. Confidence in the truth of existence of something not immediately susceptible to rigorous proof, meaning that you may see it, you may not see it, but it exists, and so you believe it. You know that it exists even though you can't see it, so you believe it. It can be a statement even unworthy of belief, and yet one will still believe it. You can believe that someone really cares about you even though they don't. 
It's simply your belief that makes you have the commitment to them even though they don't really care. I want to read, and it may be a little tedious for you, but we want to read um, Acts 26, verses 1 through 23. And then uh, King Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you are well acquainted with the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors, ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. And about noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the golds. Then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. 
That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. There in uh, the reading of our word, but also I wanted to mention that in Acts 9 and 22, you can also see another account of Saul's conversion and a more detail is given. But today for the purpose of our uh, conversation, uh, we wanted to use Acts uh, 26. We see in this text that Paul has been arrested and is standing before uh, King Agrippa to make his defense from the accusations made by the Jews. He confesses his past behavior and how he was convinced and committed to destroying Christians. In Acts 8 and 3, the King James Version was, uh, states this, as for Saul, he made havoc on the church entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. I wanted to really look at that word havoc because I really wanted to see the depth of his commitment to what he was doing to the Christians. That word havoc in the Greek means lomeinoma, means to treat shamefully or with injury to ravish, to devastate, to ruin. And when I looked at that word, I knew that only a committed enemy could carry out such a mission. Only a person committed to what they were doing would be able to carry out such a task on the people of God. Saul goes on to tell about his divine encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus and how he was appointed as a servant and a witness for the Lord. I want to submit to you today that Saul was committed to what he believed when he carried out the persecution of the church. And likewise, he was blinded on the road to Damascus his belief system changed and was committed to preaching the gospel at all costs. Saul, now Paul, was born a Roman citizen, a Pharisee, and the son of a Pharisee. He was a pure-blooded Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had the Hebrew tongue, and he followed the Hebrew customs. The Jewish world in Paul, in which Paul came, was a world that had lost their real meaning of the law of Moses. In fact, the law of Moses had been turned into 613 oral laws. For instance, a woman could not comb her hair on the Sabbath, nor could anyone drag a chair across the floor. They had taken the law of Moses to the extreme. The Pharisees demanded a rigid and scrupulous obedience. In their minds, they believed that this is what God wanted. They were a strict religious obedience to the law. In fact, this was part of the cause for the great hatred of Christ. They didn't want to hear about the resurrection. They didn't want to believe that. They had so perverted the law that they did not recognize the Messiah when he came. In fact, they crucified him. Understanding this, we can see how their hatred for Paul was so bitter after he gave his life to Christ on the road to Damascus. 
They hated him. He was like a traitor. He was like someone that had believed with them, that had walked with them, that had crucified uh, the Christians with him. And now he had turned and he had a new pardon. And now he was believing on something that they were teaching against. I know that the example of Saul may be a little radical, but it gives us a strong view of what behavior looks like when it's motivated by something we deeply believe or have faith in. What about you? What do you believe? What motivates you to have a strong commitment? Is it your family? Is it your friends? Is it your job, your career? Is it your calling to the Lord? What has God brought you from and set you on a new path to do? What does your passion and your commitment look like as it relates to your belief in God? We have been made alive in Christ. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We all have a work to do. We all have something that we can be committed to. But we must have the passion and the belief to be committed to that thing which God has called for for us to do. I want to ask you, are you saved and committed to bearing fruit? Or are you just saved to be seated? <laughs> or are you saved to be able to come into the house of the Lord, wave your hands and praise the Lord and sit down and do nothing else? Where is your commitment today? What do you believe today? What has your belief pu pushed you to today? What is your salvation behavior look like? You know, salvation has a behavior. You know, when you're saved, you walk different. When you're saved, you talk different. When you're saved, you sing different. When you're saved, you dance differently. When you're saved, you treat your neighbor differently. Salvation has a specific behavior. What is your behavior inside of your salvation look like? Saul was employed by the Sanhedrin and he believed in what he was doing and was totally committed to his mission. However wrong it may have been, he believed in what he was doing. Is there something in your life that you need to reevaluate what you're doing? How are you using your gifts? How are you using your talents? What has God blessed you with? What has God turned you from? What do you want to be committed to in this day and in this hour? In our text, Paul stands to give a defense for his life, past and present. This is a text that can very well be used to ask questions about how we respond to what we really believe. How do we respond to what we believe? If you believe that Jesus died on the cross, if you believe he died to save you, what is your response to that? If you believe that something happened on that cross that gave you life, what is your response to that? If you believe that the blood of Jesus still saves and washes and cleanses today, what is your response to that? See, because we can be saved and sat down, or we can be saved to move in the spirit and the admonition of what God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. We all have a past and we all have a present. You might want to forget about the past and press on to the present. You might want to forget about what you missed, what you missed out on, and find out what you can do today. You want to forget about what people used to say about you and what you used to do and how you used to slip and slide and think about what is God speaking to me today?
What is my commitment looking like for today? What does he want me to do today? What does he want me to produce today? What does he want me to create today? Because the Bible says that he's given us everything to live for life and godliness. He's given us everything that we need. Everything that we need, we have it right now. I want to encourage you today to take some time. I want to encourage you today to take some time and respond to what you really believe. I want you to give some thought to what you believe as it pertains to the Lord. I want you to give some thought to the questions to ask about this text. How have I been changed? What has a divine encounter done for me? Have I just taken it? Do I take advantage? Do you know we can take advantage of the Holy Spirit? Do you know we can take advantage of our uh, salvation experience? When you hear people testify, when you hear people say about I was in this and God brought me out, it's a reality. It's something that helps them to know that I've had a change on my life. And I've got to do something different with my life. I can no longer stay the same. I can no longer be that person I once was. I can no longer make up excuses and duck and dodge. I have to be committed to the passion that God has given unto me. What is your commitment today? What does it look like? What is, what is your belief system saying? Are you a strict, religious, believing, law-carrying, Bible-toting person? Or do you believe in the Holy Spirit releasing us into freedom to do the work in which we were called forth to do? What is your belief system today? Are you just religious? When somebody comes to you and talks to you, do you just throw a, a scripture at them? Do you just quote the scripture? Or do you fellowship in love with them as God fellowships in love with us? Do you bring them into your bosom and, and want to know about them, want to know about their world and know about what they're going through? What is your fellowship in your salvation looking like? What is your love walk looking like in your salvation today? Do you just turn people off because you don't like the way they look? You don't like the way they smell? You don't like the way they talk? What is your salvation experience looking like today? What do you believe and what are you committed to? Where is your passion? Who is your Jesus? And what has he done for you? I came to tell you today he set us free. He set us free from the law. <laughs> he set us free from that religious sect. He set us free, oh my God, from being so religious minded that we can't love on his people. My God, that don't look like us. Don't talk like us. Don't walk like us. And yet he saved them with the same blood. <laughs> With the same blood, are you believing today for the impossible? What kind of authority are you taking as a believer? What kind of responsibility are you taking as a believer? Are you doing your part? Because we all have a part to walk out in our salvation. You were not saved to sit. You were not saved to observe. You were saved to witness. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called to be a workman. Called to be a witness. Called to do something that would edify the kingdom of God. We were all called for a purpose. He has a plan for our lives. Glory to God. And that plan is not for just one life. That plan is not just for the preacher. That plan is for every individual life in this room. Every individual has a plan for their life. Glory to God. Every individual has a purpose.
purpose and a plan. Every individual was saved for a reason. Saved to promote the gospel. Saved to love on your neighbor. Saved to do good works. Saved to be creative. Saved to work in your gifts and in your talents. Saved to do something that will promote the kingdom of Jesus Christ. What are you committed to today? What does your belief system look like today? Oh my God, I tell you, if you can just get this today, if you can understand today that we were saved, hallelujah, not to be held up in a corner, not to be confined in chains. We were saved to be free. We were saved to walk in freedom. We were saved to praise and worship and adore our God. We were saved to move in him because in him we have our movement. In him we have our being. In him we have life and we have that life more abundantly we were saved for a purpose we were saved for a reason glory to God what is your commitment to your salvation today what do you believe and how are you going to demonstrate see because we can believe how are you going to demonstrate I recognize that the apostle Paul Ah, oh my God, I'm, 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 I'm attached to this text because it was a drastic change that came about in his life. One day he's killing and, 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 and destroying and devastating the Christians. And then the next thing you know, he's out preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, telling them how they can be saved, telling them how God, Christ died for them. He changed his commitment. He took that commitment. He changed what he believed in the negative over to what he believed in the positive as it related to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Glory to God. I want to encourage you today to think about your commitment. Because, see, we get comfortable as Christians. We get real comfortable. We get comfortable just going to church. Well, and sitting. We get comfortable looking at church online. I don't feel like going. I don't have to. You know, they are broadcasting online. So why do I need to get up and physically take my body there? I can praise the Lord at home. We're comfortable. We're too comfortable. Because when you get out and when you fellowship with the saints, when you get into the household of faith, you're going to rub elbows with somebody else. And it might be a little uncomfortable for you. It might not feel real good for you. But it's taking you out of your comfortable setting. But it's based on what you believe. If you believe that you're okay, <laughs> if you believe that you're all right just looking at the broadcast, then good. But if you have transportation and you're able to make it to the household of faith, that's where you need to be. Because that's where the kingdom of God is pronouncing what we need to do, how we need to move, how we need to work in our faith, how we need to work in our belief. You know, at home, you can just stop and go do the dishes if you want to. Oh, I hear it. Oh, yeah, I hear what they're saying. Oh, no, but you don't really hear. You're not really listening to the word of God. You may hear it, but you're not really listening. And I said that commitment takes involvement. You've got to be engaged. You've got to engage in order to be committed. You've got to go that other step. You've got to take that extra mile if you really want to be committed. Commitment means I'm going to do something different. What will you do different today? I know I'm throwing out some questions to you, but I want you to think about your belief system. I want you to think about your salvation. I want to think about why do you even come to church every Sunday? I want, to, I want you to think about why do you praise the Lord? Uh, is, your, is, is there a best part? Is there a favorite part? Is it you, do you only come for praise and worship? Do you only come because you want to hear somebody that you like to hear? Well, what, what is your real belief system saying? Huh? What is your behavior really exhibiting? What are you really saying to God about how he saved you? and set you free. What are you really saying? 
Because you know, actions do sometimes speak louder than words. Oh, what you doing? People look at us as Christians. People want to find out where is my place? How can I fit in? How can I, how can I get in this space? And what we do with our salvation experience has an effect on other people. How we look at them, how we take time to engage with them. And so I'm asking you some serious things today. What are you going to do with this belief system that you have? What are you going to do with this salvation that was freely given to us? Oh, my God. What are you going to do? Jesus came that we might have life and have that life more abundantly. He didn't come for us just to sit back and take advantage of it. But he came that we might walk in the abundance of what he has put in this earth for us to master. And we do have a mastery. We have skills. We have talents. We have things that we can do for other people. And yet we sit in our salvation. Oh, my God. I know you won't like me after today, but that's okay. Because I'm on assignment for the kingdom. And when you recognize your purpose, when you recognize your assignment, when you recognize what you believe and what you're committed to, you have to be committed no matter what anybody thinks, no matter what anybody feels. I'm telling you that when the apostle Paul was dragging people out, he didn't care what people thought about him. And the same way, when he got up and started preaching the gospel, wrote over two-thirds of the Bible, when he started that, he didn't care about people trying to kill him. He was shipwrecked. He was mobbed. He was beaten. He was dragged out of a town and left for dead. Things happen. But he was committed. <laughs> he was committed. He was committed to what he now believed in Jesus Christ. I ask you today, what does your commitment look like? And what does your behavior exemplify inside of your belief system? We need to be challenged sometimes as Christians to think outside the box and inside the kingdom. We need to be challenged. And so I challenge you today to give some thought to what you really believe and what you're doing with your belief system. Stand to your feet. I want to just offer up a prayer for us this morning. Glory to God that we would not be Christians that would just sit, that we would not be the people of God that would not allow him to use us for his glory. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today and we bless you. God, we honor you today. God, we're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful, Lord, for your mercy. We're so grateful, Lord, that you thought enough of us, Lord God, to send your only son to die on a cross that we might be saved. We're so grateful today, Lord. And so as we come, Father God, we want to be those, Lord God, that would hear you, hear your voice, God. We want to be those that would hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. We want to be those, Lord God, that would carry out your plan and your purposes for our lives, God. And so we ask, oh God, this morning, that you would visit, Lord God, each and every individual, Lord, with the questions, oh God, that have been presented, Lord. We ask, oh Father God, that you would change their minds, oh God. And as you sent Paul on a journey, God, to change their minds, Lord God, to bring them out of darkness and into your marvelous light, to change them, Lord God, from walking with Satan to walking with you. Oh, my God, to be a witness, to be a servant. God, for all of the things that you call for for each and every one of us to do, oh, God. 
for your plans and your purpose, God, for our lives, God. We ask today, oh God, that you would erect a change today, God, that none will leave the way they came, God, but they'll give thought, Lord God, to their belief system, God. Give thought to their salvation in another light, God, in the name of Jesus. Go into a deeper worship. Go in a deeper word, God. Oh, God, touch this, your people, this morning, God. Oh, Lord God, that we might walk in your kingdom and be found pleasing in thy sight. Father, we thank you, Lord God, now. You are our strength and you are our redeemer, God. Set free, God, to do good works. Bless this, your people, today. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We bless the Lord this morning. We bless him this morning. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you need prayer and you want to get better, you want to tap into your belief system and what it really means for you. If you really want to get serious about what God has for you, and maybe you have not even accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, that would be offered for you today as well. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to keep living just as you are? Are you okay with yourself? Or do you want to make some changes? What do you want to do with this salvation that has been so freely given unto us? God bless you today. God keep you in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's put our hands together one more time. Amen. Dr. Alta Davis. Praise the Lord. Listen, as she said, um, if, you know, if you're here today um, and you're in need of prayer, particularly in the area of commitment, um, we encourage you uh, to um, come down and allow one of our altar team uh, members to stand um, in agreement with you <clears throat> and to pray with you. And, amen. And pray for you. Um, you know, Americans, we are very uh, interesting people uh, and how we process um, our commitments as uh, king as citizens of the kingdom of God but as democratic citizens of the United States of America we have as I've traveled the world and met different people different people groups different nationalities um, you know we have a a sense of uh, independence unlike any other people that I've ever met and that can be good at times but it could also be bad because in the in God's kingdom we're not just to be independent but we're to be interdependent upon one another we're one body many members amen and uh, and a lot of people <clears throat> you know say that they're committed uh, to Christ and his causes uh, but their actions um, just you know, just in life, you know, tell a different story. And, uh, and you know, and it's just a reality. So when you hear a word like this today, you should, you know, do some introspection and say, you know, Lord, am I committed to the things that you've called me to be committed to? Am I committed to, um, am I committed to your kingdom? Um, am I committed to my calling? I learned a lot of, a lot of people that have callings and you just, the phone is ringing and you're not answering. Uh, you know, you're just allowing, you know, time and life to go by and not answering God's call, you know, for your life. Your call won't uh, be comfort, comfortable, won't be predictable. Um, you'll have to do things and go places that you uh, maybe didn't particularly plan on, on going. And that's okay, amen, because you're doing it, you know, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of other people, amen. <laughs> And so just doing that, you know, I've never seen a time in a generation uh, like now where people, you know, say they're committed to Christ, but not committed to any church. You know, the church is Jesus's bride and you can't have a you can't have a full relationship with Christ if you're not committed to a local assembly. It just doesn't work that way. And, um, you know, you can be deceived in thinking that way, but it just doesn't work that way. And um, and so you have to ask yourself, you know. Um, you know, where is my level of commitment in the various areas of my life? Amen. And uh, I just want, Mama, you know, I just want people to be committed like iPhone users are committed to buying a new iPhone. 
Every year, they go new processor, new outer outer shell. Come on, somebody, what else they be? New processor, new camera, nineteen hundred dollars. And people be like, sign me up. I just want, I just want, I want to see the people of God committed to God's kingdom like they are to buying a new iPhone. Come on, somebody, hey man. And uh, so, um, if you're here today, you know, as I uh, pray and do the benediction, I'm just praying. If you're here and you need prayer the area of commitment or in any area don't hesitate to come down and allow our altar team to be able to pray with you <coughs> uh, amen and uh, let's just pray father thank you for uh, this day this time and uh, just uh, the word of God that was shared with us today I pray that we would take it to heart and not allow uh, uh, any of what was spoken or said or shared fall to the ground um, Lord <clears throat> may our hearts our ears um, our lives be open wide uh, to hear what it is that you have spoken and what it is that you're desiring to do, Lord God, in us and with us. Um, we just pray that uh, for your continued blessing, um, Father, upon each area of our lives uh, and upon the remaining portion of our day. Um, I just We pray, Lord, today that you would just bless us and keep us, continue to make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lift up your countenance upon us always, Lord, and give us your peace. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.